I've been having dreams. Dreams about a game on Arrakis. A Dune area control war game. Huh, a new Dune? It just won't be the same. No, but newer Dune just might be good. We are four players in one hour. They're not human, they're- Control Arrakis, control the spice. You will be traitor and it will be okay. Give them all. One hour, one game, Dune 2021. Dune, Dune, Dune. A classic IP going through some Tulaxu Tank revival. Much like there was a 1984 Dune movie that got a rehaul with the new 2021 movie, there was that 1979 Dune area control political board game. That was facelifted in 2019, but now it's reimagined and streamlined. You're playing factions of the Dune universe, moving troops around the planet itself to control the spice to control the universe. This is Dune, a game of conquest and diplomacy. That's a bit of a mouthful. Let's just call it Dune Conquest. Oh, and uh, did you know this plays in an hour? This game, one hour. Let's get into it. Here's a quick how to play. We're all controlling these Dune factions. So we got the Trades there and Harkonnen here. We're all either trying to control three of the five strongholds on the map to win the game, or if no one achieves that by the end of the fifth round, then whoever owns the most spice wins the game. To get those strongholds, you wanna move your troops in and control them. In a round, everyone takes turns dropshipping units and moving units on the map. Dropshipping is like spawning troops and costs one spice for each. To get more of that spice, you want to send troops out to the randomly spawning spice on the map. And of course, if any two armies are in the same space, you have to fight. In this combat, each fighting player is gonna grab this battle wheel. There's four things to secretly load up here. First, the number of units that are actually fighting, then your leader, which gives you extra strength. Then it's two cards, a weapon and defensive card, which mostly have to do with trying to kill the opponent's leader. When each player has dialed in everything they wanna commit, you reveal at the same time, you check your strength, meaning your troops, your leader, and your cards, and their leader. He played Dr. Yue, meaning that was actually a traitor leader. I win the fight. Wait, what? Yeah, so traitors is a mechanic where you are dealt a traitor card in the beginning of the game. And if that leader is ever used against you in a fight, you can reveal it and automatically win that fight and lose nothing. That's that Dune treachery for you. Usually there's not gonna be a traitor, so then you just add up your leader value plus any committed troops. Then you see if your battle cards are able to kill your opponent's leader. Whoever loses gets it rough. They lose all their troops here. Then their winner will lose any troops they committed to the fight. If there's multiple troops in an area, you just keep passing around these battle wheels until there's only one force left. Off to the Tlaxu tanks these dead troops go. Then after all fights are done, then you collect spice. So that means each unit can collect up to two spice. So these four Atreides troops would collect this eight spice here. It goes to their bank. Then it's the end of the round. If no one has three strongholds yet, you just move that round marker up. But if this is currently at five, meaning that's the last round, then you just count up all your spice to see who wins the game. And each stronghold counts as five spice towards this. One more thing though, the storm. This moves every round through a die roll and it kills any units in sand spaces it passes through, so watch out. Strongholds and rock areas are safe from the storm. Let's dive into the actual review now, starting with the pros. And this right here, this board is the Dune, as pictured in the back of the first book, with all of its regions labeled. You got Carthag, Arakin, the Great Flat, the Greater Flat. There's even these sand areas versus the rock areas as a distinction. And you movie watchers of the new Dune movie will be right at home here. They practically have every character from the movie here with the leaders. You got MJ, uh, I mean uh, Zendaya as Chani. And on the other side with the Trades, it's Timothy Chalamet, Timothy Chalamet, yeah. 
Player boards are nice solid cards with cool quotations on the back. Movie art or er, screen caps continue with the cards, but they actually did do some extra work for the card backs, which is always appreciated. If you're not that 1978 Dune veteran who played something a bit similar for countless hours, this game is still easy to learn. The rulebook is concise, just going over all the phases in basically 10 short pages. It doesn't have a fact, but answered all of our questions. And if you're still confused, there's this thing on the back to help you. If you don't know what the heck is going on with the Dune universe at all, it's explained on the first page. There's even strategy tips for each of the factions. Wow, that is super, super appreciated. So of course we gotta talk about the four asymmetric factions. And these are very nuanced for how simple and short this game is, leading to all these fun, different approaches to try to get the most spice melange. Our resident good guys from the theme, the Trades, have that prescience. They can see part of the future. Every time they fight, they get to ask their opponent for one aspect of the fight they're playing. So they can always know what weapon card their opponent is using if they want. To also help with fighting, they have so many leaders. So they can fight a lot and have a bunch die. And then still keep fighting. It also gives them way more options to play around traitors. Speaking of traitors, we got the sneaky. They're brutal. Bad guys, they're Harkonnen, who can be simplified into, we have a bunch of traitors, mwahahaha. Instead of getting the just one traitor like other factions, they get multiple, and get to choose after everyone else has shuffled their traitor discards back into the deck. In a four player game, the Harkonnen have four traitors. There's even more to this though. Before every fight they're in, they can just look at the top card of the traitor deck and replace one of their traitors if they want. So they're a constant, constant traitor threat. Okay, but maybe you want to play with lots of money, and that's the Imperium. Not only do you start with the most spice, which is money, but people pay you to buy the market cards, the special cards that can do all sorts of extra things in this game. They also seem to have the Bene Gesserit at their disposal here, since they can use the voice. Yeah, as the Imperium, you can command other players to play or not play weapons during a fight. You can say, you must use poison. Oh, <clears throat> sorry, I, I didn't get the, <clears throat> the pitch right. You must use poison. The voice is fun stuff, and it just leads to all these mind games and more card play you can do while fighting. The last faction is the Fremen, who are by far the most unique to play. Since they're, well, on the planet as natives, they never have to ship in forces from outer space by spending spice. They can just spawn five forces every turn for free on the map. Pair that with how they're really good at moving across the planet so they can move six spaces instead of three. Or they can move two groups, three spaces each. They also just never get destroyed by the storm. Oh, and then they can ride the worm if that card is drawn. Playing the Fremen is really like playing a different game, where the value for spice is so different from the others, and your game is so consistent with five troops around but you can't ever spawn more than five. Besides this trader deck, there's these two fun decks of cards you can draw from, the battle and the market. And these are gonna add some fun variety to your games. The battle ones, you draw up to four every round, meaning you get them for free. And look at that, you can even throw people off by getting worthless cards to play. These are primarily a rock, paper, scissors dynamic with your opponent, but there's stuff in here to spice it up, like the reinforcements to add plus three to your total. Or how about the endless ranks, meaning that after you see what your opponent has dialed in, you can increase your number to matches or beat it. The more primo cards, these market ones, are all entirely different in draw, ranging from ways to ship in more troops, just like that, bam, out of nowhere. Or you can get a new trader, bye bye Dr. Yue. Or there's the mother load to double the spice in one area. Or how about using those cool ornithopters to move across the map quickly? We can't go through all 24 of these, but we have to talk about the Mind Killer card. Wow, this card is crazy. It lets you just straight up temporarily negate another faction's specialty. One of my favorite uses for this is to stop the Harkonnen from claiming any traitors at all during combat. That really helps to ease my mind. Now we gotta praise how this game does its win conditions, which makes this game feel really tense and tight throughout. Remember, you wanna control either three out of the five strongholds or have the most spice melange if the game happens to go to the very end of five rounds. 
There's a lot of interesting play and counterplay on this board as people are debating between these two win conditions. Strongholds or Spice? Strongholds or Spice? Strongholds and Spice? Do you pressure Strongholds to prevent your opponents from getting them, or pressure the Spice on the map, which is victory points? This question gets twisted all these different ways throughout the rounds, where it really does seem like anyone with at least some foothold in Strongholds can pressure a win if combats go their way. And heck, even if you're not going for a Stronghold win per se, each Stronghold is worth 5 Spice at the end of the game, that's a lot of points for control. The fact that Spice is victory points and money makes you extra careful about spawning troops, where sure, you can literally just drop 20 Spice to spawn 20 troops if you want on a turn, but maybe you want that Spice in your pocket. But then you need troops on the board to do anything, like harvest Spice, and then you need enough troops to survive fights if your opponents try to contest you, so you can actually harvest the Spice. This ties into how this game has a fantastic focus on positioning on the map. You're always trying to position around the strongholds, or the randomly now spawning spice, or even leftover spice from a previous round. You never feel that slow or trapped on the map, because units can move three spaces, which is practically half the planet for some sectors. And you can dropship anywhere that's not a stronghold on the map, but everyone can do it. So where on the planet are people focusing? How are players constantly reacting to other people's dropships of varied amounts of troops and fast movement? But then you need to be mindful of the storm for all movement, where you can't move into it, and if you're not Fremen, all your troops just die when the storm comes by. Yeah, when the storm is coming, move your troops out of there. Now we want to praise the combat system of Dune Conquest, which is the second chunky part of the game after positioning on the board. Every time you fight, there's four shifting variables to put into this battle wheel for you and your opponent to psych each other out with. Let's start with the battle cards you can slot in, where you're playing this rock, paper, scissors fight with one defense and then also one weapon card. Do you play the extraction fan poison defense because you just saw your opponent win a fight using the poison gom jabar on the same round? Choosing your fights based off your opponent's hands, or sequencing your fights to get information on their hands are all great plays here. Now, that unit selection on the battle wheel is so, so tricky. You typically want to defer on the side of committing more troops, where, sure, you'll be losing more troops if you win, but you don't want to lose the combat because then you'll lose every troop anyways, so you might as well commit more. But if you commit too much, your opponent can be getting exactly what he wanted by having your huge force. Or how about factoring in how many troops you'll need for the fight right after this? Also, if you're trying to harvest that spice melange, well, you gotta make sure that you have enough troops to harvest all of it. It can feel icky to just leave some freely there. The last combat variable is the leaders, where you have Duncan Idaho or Stilgar give extra strength to add onto your troops. Each faction has their own leaders, and you wanna make sure that you don't throw leaders around carelessly because if they die, eh, you don't have them for a bit anymore, and you have to pay to get them back. And then when they die, your opponent that killed them gets spice for their strength. But remember, traitor as a mechanic? Well, this is on the back of everyone's head, where you're constantly looking from fight to fight to not get traitored. And it's a whole mind game manipulation of angling your enemies into playing their unloyal leaders in a fight against you. Everyone's traitor is just this huge theme behind the game, where you can sense people attacking each other because they might have each other's leaders. Or there's a lot of tension on yourself, and you can even mind game and scare yourself into only wanting to play your weaker leaders, because every time you look at that face down card, you think, yeah, they, they might have my Sardaukar captain, or my reverend mother, and uh, I'm just gonna stick with my weaker leaders to be on the safe side. But then that's but then that's inefficient. Or you can do the super bold play of not revealing your traitor card in a fight, because the time just doesn't seem right yet, and you want to lure that player into a false sense of security. Man, that is just so nasty. Oh, and remember how the Harkonnen can have up to four traitors at a time, and can cycle traitor cards out? So traitors will always be relevant in a game if you're playing with Harkonnen, even if all traitors have been revealed so far. This game is really bloody and swingy, with constant troops dying in combat, and then there's traitors, and then you're spending spice all the time, with two victory conditions, 
And so Dune Conquest actually has comeback potential without pure comeback mechanics. It is possible for maybe the Trades, who are a little more spy starved to get entirely wiped from the board and then have no more spice left to spawn anything else. To keep people going, you got three spice with this charity spice to at least keep doing stuff. Okay, that doesn't seem like a lot of spice, but due to how combat works, you can really annoy opponents with one or two troops fighting their huge army because you always are guaranteed to have battle cards to play. And they will tend to overcommit troops in fights to prevent their entire army from dying. Plus, if you still have your traitor card, you can always scare anyone in fights. The game never seems to let up the pedal to the metal in pacing. Even though no one can win on the first or second rounds, you still want to pressure strongholds, since if you have two of them early game, well, you can just easily blitz another stronghold if you have the resources and you just win the game. This is so scary with the Fremen, who can move two legions across the board to attack twice. All throughout this one hour, there is constant tension. Legions are fighting to the death over strongholds to win or prevent wins. There's constant new spies coming on the board, and you always get new battle cards to freshen up combat. And you can always pay the Imperium for more of these special market cards. Who knows what you'll get? These constant hidden cards keep you guessing on each other's combat potential, from counterattacks in combat, or biting down on a poison tooth to kill both leaders in combat. Or even at the end of the game, someone can have this secret spice stockpile for 8 extra spice. And I know I keep saying this, but I can't stop. This game is an hour long. It's an hour long! Once you get down the variables and the battle nuance, it can take easily less than an hour with 4 people if you get a win in the 3rd or 4th round. To wrap this up, this has that Dune theme meeting the gameplay so well, and that's been pretty obvious so far for you Dune fans out there. You pay spies to dropship troops to the desert to collect spies and they can get killed by a sandworm. There's Paul using prescience on his enemies. And then there's even Reverend Mother using the voice. Okay, sure, she's not exactly working for the Imperium in the actual story, but eh, it's close enough. Check this out. Say we're fighting here and I use the voice to command someone else to use a las gun on me, and I use a shield. What does that mean? What does that mean? There's all these what ifs in Dune Conquest that come up as you manage traders, troops, spice, and your battle and market cards. What if Dr. Yue never betrays the Atreides, and is somehow able to be this Dr. General one-man army while Paul sits at home and does nothing. What if Stilgar is actually an Imperial Mole? Or what about, what about if Baron Harkonnen was an Atreides Mole? Oh, holy what is going on. Cons time. And we couldn't really find anything substantial, and this is pretty crazy coming from the Dune 2019 reprint that we reviewed a while back. The long-awaited reprint of the area control game based on open-ended interpretations. Countless amounts of trivial arguments over Dude really showcases how newer games have gotten really good at streamlining phases and actions that you shouldn't feel bad about just giving this one a pass. Just giving this one a pass. Giving this one a pass. Yeah, there's been a lot of changes in this Dune backdrop. So let's just move on. Now we get to the nitpicks. First, we wish there was some sort of player aid that referenced all the other faction leader loadouts because you can only see your own on this sheet here. Most people are going to have their leaders face down in front of them, the actual tokens to keep it secret when they're loading up their battle wheel. We found ourselves constantly standing up and looking across the table to see how much our opponent's leaders would help in a fight. While we're at this, we would have liked to see a brief player aid of the crucial rock, paper, scissors dynamic of the battle cards like shield beats projectile, but loses to las gun sort of thing. But these aren't a huge deal because the game is rather simple anyways. When we get to the board here, these cardboards chits should probably be stacked. And when you do stack them, it's kind of hard to tell the quantity of them. We often found ourselves asking, uh, hey, how many troops did you uh, put in Carthag again? Yeah, yeah, can you just count them for me? And then of course, when you're moving them around the map, you gotta make sure these, uh, these towers of troops don't fall. 
Got to restack them. Ah, yeah, cardboard kits, yep. You can't use counters for multiples like a 3x marker because the quantity of units is capped in this game. But then is this 20 troops or 18? Or is it 19? At the end of it, this isn't too bad in this short game because with all the bloodshed, there aren't that many big pockets of troops on the board at the same time. Now let's get to the gameplay nitpicks. Namely this battle card here, the slow dart. This puts your opponent's leader to sleep, making them zero for one fight. But regardless of defense played, there's no card counterplay to this. So while it's not as good as killing your opponent's leader outright, well, it's like your opponent's leader was never there for the fight. So you have a big advantage. If you're pushing for strongholds to win the game, you don't care about not getting the spice from not getting the leader kill. You just want to win the fight. We would want at least some restriction on the card if there's no counterplay in defense. Like how about you can only slow dart strong leaders or leaders with odd numbers. The next nitpick is this trader mechanic. Wait, what? We just praise this so much in the pros, right? But there is no true mechanic to figure out which leaders have been traded. So especially early game, you really have little idea on whether or not you're gonna get traded unless you happen to pick one of your own leaders as a trader, being that it's safe. But then that can hurt your upsetting odds in the future as you can't trader your opponents. Tradering is inherently just a very, very swingy mechanic where you can lose your strongest leader and the winner gets spice for that leader's strength and keeps all their troops alive. They win the fight even if they had just one single troop versus your 12. It's possible. Sometimes they didn't even plan for you to play the trader. It's not like they're pre-programming the trader reveal and there's no battle cards that prevent tradering. In the original area control dunes, yeah, the trader mechanic was far from ideal but it tied in a lot more closely with the diplomacy of those games, where you could slowly acquire information on which leaders were traded. Until then, you were encouraged to play more conservatively and use your weaker leaders until you were sure. But in Dune Conquest, well, the game is so short, it's only an hour, and there's way less focus on diplomacy. So in those earlier fights, even in the third round, whoever wins can be sometimes a bit of a toss up. Remember, we like traders way more in Dune Conquest here because the game just isn't as punishing and way shorter if you do lose an insanely crucial fight. With it being shorter, you probably just take it less seriously too. As for player count, you probably want to play with four players to see all the asymmetric powers and for the best balance of fighting. With three players, this game can suffer a little bit of two players fight each other and then the person that moves last just gets to have a spice harvest for free, or just get a stronghold for free. Granted, this doesn't happen all the time, especially later in the game when each player has different groups of troops, and the strongholds are hotly contested. There is a two-player mode where you 1v1 each other, and this seems a little wonky here, but we haven't tried it. You do get these change player boards where you have the Harkonnen and Imperium team up against the Fremen and Atreides. Well, hey, that's pretty thematic, I guess. But you do get leaders randomly, which could lead to some weird power imbalances. Uh, hey, props to them for trying to make this happen, but you probably want to play with four for the full experience here. Last couple nitpicks, these cards are thin. They're pretty darn thin. Probably want to sleeve at least these. Then this game does come with an answer, but no plastic bag. So yeah, you want to buy at least a handful of plastic bags for all the spice tokens and the, the faction tokens. Otherwise, it's going to get real messy real fast in here. Now it's time for scoring. We got a recommender score where we try to critically evaluate the pros and cons of this game. And Dune, a game of conquest and diplomacy, aka Dune Conquest, is going to get a... <laughs> it's a masterpiece. We just can't stop thinking about this older dude that we got to review the reprint of in 2019. And yeah, that, that was a game from a different era of board gaming. And we just had so many issues with it when it came to our review. 
Sure, it was wildly thematic with alliances, owning strongholds, the use thopters, and even the four different win conditions included. The Atreides player was taking notes like a scribe and selling information, and the Bene Gesserit could predict who wins the game. But its flaws were so glaring in a modern take, come over 30 years from the original design. A couple of big ones were that traders were way too swingy for how long and punishing the game is, the runtime wasn't consistent at all, leading to two or six hour games, and the game just had so much rule jank that we weren't even sure which set of rules to follow. Now the rulebook is just so easy and clean, just like the game. And there's still all that spice harvesting on the board. There's a combat, look at this, get the spice there. There's a combat wheel fighting. There's a drop shipping troops onto the board and moving them into strongholds. That's still here. When you streamline all this stuff up, it really is just a different feeling with Dune Conquest's speed and accessibility. There's no more sweeping theme or large scale machinations, no more blind auctions, no more Bene Gesserit or Spacing Guild factions, no more alliance cards, meaning no joint victories. So if you do want lots of diplomacy, there's not that much in this new game here. There's some, but don't be too fooled by the game having diplomacy in its name. Those who want something really spot on with the books, like Fremen terraforming the planet or the shield wall blowing up, may want to keep in mind the older version of Dune that can allow for the theme and diplomacy to really settle in over many, many hours. Or maybe this newer version has too much randomness or too much forgiveness with all the market cards being different and the storm die rolling and people are drawing battle cards all the time. If you're looking to get some Dune area control to the table on a consistent basis, especially with some Dune fans that might not know too much about board gaming, this is the package to get. The design team just hit the nail on the head exactly with the marketing meets the gameplay expectations. One of the good indicators of the more casualness is this card, the Sandworm. In the books and in the original Dune game, this was called Shahalud, Shai Halud. Yeah. That, that's not in this game because a more casual audience wouldn't know what that name is. They would know, oh, it's the sandworm I saw in the movies. Dune Conquest is still the brutal universe of Dune, with constant massacres on Arrakis with you bleeding troops constantly. If you slip, the storm will swallow you up. Lasgun Shield Nuke is still scary. But Dune theme aside, this is a fast area control game filled with the wide decision making on where to dropship, the tension of all sorts of cards with your battle wheel, and why not get greedy and chase after all the spice melange for points? And it's all within an hour. An hour. <laughs> Can you guess the trade -off? At 50 bucks MSRP for these components, it does feel a little like the spice must flow too freely out of your wallet, but we want to give the benefit of the doubt because it probably wasn't cheap to get the rights to this movie art. And the cost is worth it for those who are just getting into the Dune universe, board gamers who couldn't ever get six players together for the multi-hour original, and even die-hard Dune fans who can just see this as a simple short area control that still has good theming. You cannot know anything about modern board gaming. See this at your store, pick it up, bring it home, and start playing all in the same night. All in the same night. That's something that the original Dune, this six player Dune, could not ever do. And so we're curious in the future if there's stories about people getting into this modern board game hobby by just seeing this game and buying it and playing it. Personal score time. I'm gonna give Doom Conquest a seven out of 10. I have a good experience with it. Here's the thing, that score is really tentative right now because I only played once at three player. And when I look over everything, it really looks like it's meant to be played at four and I can definitely see myself loving and playing the shit out of Dune Conquest at four player. But I don't got no prescience, so what about my thoughts on the game right now? Massive, and I mean massive improvement over the original Dune board game. Like, oh my god, the original was agonizingly tedious to play. Nobody in our group liked it. And I had to be the guy going like, it tried to play more Dune for our show side review. And our friends were like, no, 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 stop. Shout out to our friends, y'all are troopers. The original Dune I always saw as a turd disguised as a diamond. It looks like has so many awesome mechanics going for it, but then the rules were trash. And actually playing with them was extremely slow while 
mechanically, whoever had the best memory usually won, unless everyone ganging up on them. But this Dune is just a diamond being a diamond. No! <laughs> Random <laughs> shield, let's go! <laughs> Feels bad. It takes most of the cool parts of the original and cuts out all the confusing bullshit into a nice and concise 30 minute to hour long game. And that's a really nice time frame, by the way, because I've always been interested in finding an area control game that's under an hour because one to two hours is dominated by Root. And then past that, we got TI4. Dune Conquest has so much of what I like in these types of games. Potential for lots of fighting, crazy cool asymmetric powers, and a ton of options for what you can do. My personal gripes still come from traitors still being a winner take all, and that even though you have lots of options, the gameplay loop still boils down to, do I go for spice or strongholds? Okay, who am I fighting? All right, I'm gonna do these battle plans. Yep, okay. The decision making seems a little more one dimensional, especially since everyone's constantly drawing new battle cards. So unless you're Atreides or Imperium, battle plans can kind of just feel really arbitrary. Still, streamlining Dune to this level is impressive as hell because the mechanics are all really familiar and faithful to the original. So it was really easy to just jump in and start playing. My complaints barely even matter because the game is so short. Like I cannot stress enough just how brisk Dune Conquest is. It actually feels like in area control, stuff is constantly happening and positioning matters. Unlike the original, where you spend so much time waiting and waiting and then sometimes reacting, all while never committing anything huge until late game. Also, positioning barely even mattered because of how slow everything was. You almost always shipped everywhere and that was that. I like when positioning matters, okay? It's like the easiest way to incur thinking ahead and representing threat. How hard is that to do? Anyways, yeah, good times at Dune Conquest. We'll definitely play more in the future because it's easy to slot in. My personal score for Dune Conquest is gonna be a 8 out of 10. I have a great time with it. Man, oh man, am I impressed. I am a pretty big Dune fan, more so of the books, and when I played that original six player Dune, ah, I did not have a good time, so I was apprehensive going into this. Was it still gonna be too punishing with this trader mechanic that seems similar. The components are kind of, eh? But in fact, this hits so many sweet spots. I never felt that the system of Dune, this game of no progression, needed to be long. And now the action starts right away and never overstays its welcome. And with the huge decision-making on where to drop ship or how to wage fights based off of cards or traders I have, I never felt that it was too short either. I once had this crazy fight where I thought the game was about to end, all for a las gun and shield combo to save the day against Daniel. <laughs> oh, Tim picked the right card. We las gun the shield. Yeah. Oh, so everyone dies. Everyone dies. Oh no. Wait, that's crazy. The asymmetry is just perfect for me. Every faction is just different to play or play against, especially these Fremen. But it all smoothly goes down the hatch with how intuitive these powers are. This game is so open-ended that I just want to show this to more people to see how they do their troop movement. Everyone just moves and commits troops a little bit differently. It's really fun to watch, especially as I react in my own set faction specialties. So what's holding it back from a nine or even a 10? Well, for starters, I'm not really a big fan of this movie art. It looks pretty cheesy to me. Then the static setup with only four factions is not quite enough variance for me, and I can actually see myself lowering my score to a six or a seven if I play this too many times. But let's talk about traitors. I still don't like their feast or famine nature, where if you get traitored, it can feel so bad. A traitor to win the game is totally fine because the game ends. But in the beginning, it just feels like BS to be in those big fights, which slows me down from fighting big early so I can't always be as silly as I want here, but I want to throw a lot of troops in. But hey, this game just isn't that long anyways, and is far less punishing than the original Dune, which I still have PTSD over these Harkonnen betrayals, and then spies being hidden information in a multi-hour game. Oh, what, that was such a grind of a game. Now I can actually ask people how much spice they have, or just see it, and get a decent idea of how power levels are going into combat. With this being an hour long, there's just way more at bats to use these cool card interactions or use traders or get traders and 
I'm decently okay with this mechanic because, well, this game is so short and it's a unique feeling I don't get in any other game besides Dune 2019. Don't like that game. In this, there is just something hilarious about getting betrayed by Chani, my Chani, in my most crucial moment when my friend army is going out. <laughs> Chani, Zendaya, why you betray me? Zendaya, Zendaya, why? No, why you betray me? Stop that good looking. The fact that this new Dune exists makes me never want to play the original Dune again. Now I am officially lowering my score for Dune 2019 to a two out of 10. You'd have to pay me to play that game again. This right here is a dream come true. It's a personal win for me to see this out there that people can buy it. I kid you not. The first time we played this game, I played with non-board gamers and we just went through this rule book page by page, reading it out loud. And that actually worked to learn the game. Dune fans, give this a shot. Give it a shot. Like to hear what you think about this new Dune game or even comparisons to the original. Anyways, thanks to our patrons for making videos like this possible. We got Manuel G, Brian C, Cliff H, Aaron W, Max B, Bora, Jimmy M, C, Charlie Pico, Tedes, Sam S, Trav Zor, Vat, Alvin Y, Vom Ski, Ryan D, Jeff L, Matt G, Pierre Z, Swinnison everyone, Ryan J, Brad G, TML, Period, Mark A, James M, Charles, Evan B, Charles B Jr., Josh J, Basketball, Rado, Sophie, Ryan Z, Colin Allen, Hunter T, Pearson B, Omar F, MY, Ethan P, Bradley J, John C, Galvin V, Dirk S, SS Co, Alex L, Rob R, Sandro Chen 2, Dave F, Josh R, Pat, Cyril C, Il Wayne, Kyle M, Amir H, and, and Right Left Spin, and Keanu. We also got two Mad Lads of Cardboard. We got ZL and Jeff L. We also got this guy right there. We also got our Mad Lady of Cardboard. We got Amy. Remember to like, subscribe, all that cool stuff. We got a Dune Imperium review very, very, very slowly in the works. See you guys later. Bye-bye.